Weaving is the life of the people of Pasay. It has been there for centuries already. But now we plan to give it more life from ordinary mats to something more contemporary na maging part siya ng fashion. Lara is one way of revolutionizing the banig industry, but it does not end there. Ako po ay si Anita Mindova Ogrimin. Ako po yung presidente ng Base Association for Native Industry Growth in Short Banig. Nakakataba ng aming puso na global na na, na, na pag-uusapan na Ito yung ginagawa ng mga weavers ng base. Nung tulungan po kami ni Congresswoman Antan, umangat yung presyo ng banig. Sa ngayon, nakakatulong na kami sa pamilya namin. Pangarap po namin na magkaroon kami ng Sariling processing center ng banig. Pangarap din namin, mas umangat pa ang buhay ng mga weavers at saka yung mga nagtatanim din ng tikog. Gusto namin na ma-encourage yung creativity ng mga Samarno, ng mga Basay nun, para mas mapansin pa yung industry na to. And hopefully, it will alleviate poverty as well.
weaving is the life of the people of Pasay. It has been there for centuries already. But now we plan to give it more life from ordinary mats to something more contemporary na maging part siya ng fashion. Lara is one way of revolutionizing the banig industry, but it does not end there. Ako po ay si Anita Mindoba Ogrimin. Ako po yung presidente ng Basay Association for Native Industry Growth in Short Banig. Nakakataba ng aming puso na global na na, na, na pag-uusapan na ito yung ginagawa ng mga weavers ng Basay. Nung tulungan po kami ni Congresswoman Antan, umangat yung presyo ng banig. Sa ngayon, nakakatulong na kami sa pamilya namin. Pangarap po namin na magkaroon kami ng sariling processing center ng banig. Pangarap din namin, mas umangat pa ang buhay ng mga weavers at saka yung mga nagtatanim din ng tikog. Gusto namin na ma-encourage yung creativity ng mga Samarno, ng mga Basay nun, para mas mapansin pa yung industry na to. And hopefully, it will alleviate poverty as well. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Mas maganda ba kayo kaysa sa umaga? Ayan, so I hope you have already taken your coffee because we have to brace another exhilarating experience this day. Welcome to the second International Poverty Conference hosted by Summer State University and co-hosted by Northwest Summer State University in collaboration with the nine Eastern Visayas State Universities and Colleges. My name's Jeff, your moderator. Before we kick off, please be guided by the following online rules and netiquette. Primarily, please turn off your notifications. Those little things might cause distractions to other meeting attendees. Next. Turn on the lights. If you can, get proper lighting and sit near a window or have a bright lamp nearby. Then look at the camera when talking. I know it's a bit awkward at first, but audience will appreciate eye contact. Then mute also your microphone if you are not talking and once you've been admitted to the Zoom room. Clear the space behind you. See if you can move your camera so it is directed to a wall or a clear spot. But since we have a virtual background, specially designed for this year's IPAVCON, we are encouraged to use it. Please come early. If someone is late, there is no need to recap. Keep it professional. Maintain professional posture and appearance. And stay present. You might miss out on key information. And since we are, all, uh, we are using a webcam, let's use attentive body language. And lastly, give some grace. Be patient with other participants and allow some grace for any communications that occur. Everybody is encouraged to be active and participating. We hope everything is set on your virtual rooms and uh, we will be right back after these videos. Weaving is the life of the people of Pasay. It has been there for centuries already. But now we plan to give it more life from ordinary mats to something more contemporary na maging part siya ng fashion. Lara is one way of revolutionizing the banig industry, but it does not end there. Ako po ay si Anita Mindoba Ogrimin. Ako po yung presidente ng 
Base Association for Native Industry Growth, in short, BANE. Nakakataba ng aming puso na global na na, na, na pag-uusapan na ito yung, yung ginagawa ng mga waivers ng base. Nung tulungan po kami ni Congresswoman Antan, umangat yung presyo ng banig. Sa ngayon, nakakatulong na kami sa pamilya namin. Pangarap po namin na magkaroon kami ng sariling processing center ng banig. Pangarap din namin, mas umangat pa ang buhay ng mga weavers at saka yung mga nagtatanim din ng tikog. Gusto namin na ma-encourage yung creativity ng mga Samarno, ng mga Basay nun para mas mapansin pa yung industry na to. And hopefully, it will alleviate poverty as well. This quote, which says, The things you take for granted, someone else praying for. Poverty is real, so as its alleviation. Amidst the crisis, we continue to move forward towards attaining our common goal, a world where no children, not even one, are starving. This is the truth. Unless we hate poverty, we cannot be wealthy. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I welcome you all to the, say, uh, to the day two of the second International Poverty Conference. Hashtag IPAVCON 2020. We are live here in Summer State University via Zoom and with our live streaming on Facebook and YouTube. At this juncture, let's acknowledge the presence of the Almighty through a prayer.
day one was a blast to give us a wrap of what uh, what were transpired yesterday. Uh, let me do the honor. First day of the second international conference was a successful opening and the warm start for a fruitful three-day confirm. We were graced by renowned speakers and guests, not only from our very own Philippines, but also from our neighboring countries all around the globe. We were joined by our partner collaborators, our very active SUCs of the Eastern Visayas, and they are the following. Northwest Summer State University, IFABCON 2020 co-host. We have also from Eastern Visayas State University, Eastern Summer State University, Leyden Normal State University, rather Leyden Normal University, and Province State University, Southern Leyden State University, Visaya State University, Eastern Philippines, Biliran Province State University, Palompon Institute of Technology, and St. Paul School of Professional Studies. We were also joined by the different state universities and colleges and national government agencies across all of the Philippine Islands. The day one was a heartfelt opening as we were warmly welcomed by our very own community leaders, the Amai Hansama Gov um, Samar, Governor Keltan, and the ever legislative district Samar Province, Congresswoman Sherry Ann Tan. And of course, we were also earnestly welcomed by the leading light of Summer State University, the mind behind every fruitful poverty conference, the SSU president, our very own Dr. Marilyn D. Cardoso. The day one, international keynote speaker, Dr. Christopher Galloway, head of the public relations of the Massey University, New Zealand, talked about their country's best practices in the areas of risk communication and successful handling of the coronavirus disease. He also talked about how the local government units or the LGUs play a crucial role in strengthening resilience and minimizing risk and how the ahadim shall assist the LGUs in providing appropriate education programs and trainings. Afternoon session came and another distinguished guest graced yesterday's virtual event. We had the chance to listen to the inspiring words of one of the commissioners of the Philippine Commission on Higher Education, Dr. Darilag. In his afternoon keynote address, he talked about addressing poverty through education. He discussed the different ways on how teachers can address the needs of their learners who live in the margins of poverty. And that is through changing the school culture from pity to empathy, deepening the understanding of employees, embodying respect, embedding social skills in all lessons, and being inclusive. He also shared the different initiatives of CHED to help combat COVID-19 in partnership with the Yahanim and LGUs as well. Finally, in the last part of the afternoon session, we were joined by our fellow research enthusiasts in one of the highlights of this entire poverty conference, the competition for the most outstanding paper award. Yesterday, four researchers from University of Terangano, Malaysia, Visaya State University, and Samar State University. Philippines vied for the title of the most outstanding paper award. And that was the recap of the first day of this three-day international poverty conference. Today, we continue about the crisis as we take into the heart the words of our commissioner, Darilag, yesterday, and I quote, let us continue to help free people from poverty in all of its forms. And of was the day one recapitulation of what were transpired yesterday. Poverty alleviators, you are on board with our track, environmental crisis and the management. To tell you there are 15, again, we have 15 presenters for this track and each presenter 
will be evaluated based on the following guidelines for best oral presentation. Firstly, presenters are given a maximum of 10 minutes to present their papers in their identified strand during the parallel sessions. After every presentation, the question and answer portion will commence. Next, for papers with multiple authors, only one author is allowed to present an answer during the Q&A. However, as long as the co-author or authors have registered for and attended the conference, they will still be provided the necessary certificates of presentation. The best oral presenter will be Best oral presenters of the respective tracks should earn at least 85% to qualify for the award. The decision of the panel of judges shall be final and unappealable. The rating sheets are considered personal notes of the panel of judges and shall not be given to any constant or requesting party. Let me show you how our judges will evaluate you based on our following criteria. We have two main criteria. We have technical and the actual paper presentation. For the technical, we have 60 points. Under technical, we have the originality of idea, 10 points. The appropriateness of the methodology, 20 points. Potential for the creation of new or advancement of knowledge and evidence, a benefit to the area covered by the research, that is 10 points. Anticipated output, outcomes and impacts of the research, including potential contribution to economy and social benefits, 10 points. And the quality of technical paper, submitted technical report, including your abstract, 10 points. Under actual paper presentation, we have in total of 40 points. The presentation or the overall impact on the audience, understandability, the concise reporting within given time frame, that is 10 points. Also, the formal presentation, which is a clear description of the research and uh, who has also follows given format, that is given with 20 points. And the lastly, researchers' salesmanship, the knowledge on the project communications, that is 10 points. In total of 100 points. So again, that was our criteria for judging for the best oral presenter. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to give us a bird's eye view of what mainly is our track is all about, well, Environmental crisis and the management covers all types of non-human health crisis and management. It also includes studies that venture topics in environmental, ecological, economic, and other types of crisis. To help us select our winners, we have the following evaluators and because they will be spending the whole duration to watch listen let me do the honor firstly we have dr riz rupert l ortiz he is a vice president for research extension and external affairs from northwest summer state Victoria Di Naboya, the Vice President for Research and Extension at Leyte Normal University. Lastly, we have Dr. Francis Ann C., the Vice President for Academics, Research and Innovation from Southern Leyte State University. Once again, they are our dear evaluators who will be spending the whole duration to watch, listen, and also to give their comments or questions regarding your paper presentation. Without much further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's start the ball rolling. Let me call in our first presenter. Our first presenter is from Southern Leyte State 
University from SLSU. And uh, she will be presenting the paper, the research paper entitled, The Influence of Sargassum as Feed Supplement on the External Egg Quality Traits of the Japanese Quails. Let's all welcome Miss Mary Connie S. Inso. To this conference, a pleasant day to one and all. I am Marie Cody East Enso presenting our study on the influence of Sergasum, Sergasum modicum, as feed supplements on the external egg quality traits of Japanese quail, Cortonix Cortonix Japonicum. Despite of the increasing demand of quail meat and eggs, fewer investors ventures into quail production. Unknown to many, Quail are relatively easier to raise compared with chicken. They require less nurturing because they are not susceptible to common poultry diseases. To produce quality quail eggs with maintain high nutritional value and with eggshell strength for higher and faster return of investment, feed content and management of quail should be closely monitored. That is according to Bihar in his study in 2017. On the screen is a picture of a brown macro algae salgasum modicum. It is reported to have high ash content that can provide minerals and trace elements that are beneficial in both fertilizer and animal feed. It is one among 187 kinds of seaweeds listed in Egypt. It is reported to have animal nutritional and health benefits. Sargassum modicum is locally known as Samo in southern Leyte. During high tide, it is brought and left scattered in the shoreline when the tide sets low. People in the area, without minding the nutritional value of Samo or the Sargassum modicum, considered it as a weed and therefore burned it during shoreline cleaning. Due to the high calcium requirements of layer and broiler breeders, the knowledge on the calcium sources that can supplement or be used in order to improve or maintain performance and egg quality is very much important. Here is the result of the nutrient composition analysis of Sergasum modicum. It is found out that it has high ash content and it has 14.057% of calcium. That is why our study was conducted in order to verify the effects on the external egg quality traits of Japanese quail supplemented with varying levels of sargassum. The materials and method of our study, we used 60 heads of laying quails at 8 months old. The birds was divided into 3 treatments and 1 control group with 3 replications. It was carried out in a complete randomized design. In this study, Sargassum modicum was used as a feed supplement in the assigned treatment. From the nutritional point of view, minerals are the ingredients considered as the most essential that composes 5% in the animal body. That is why the inclusion of sargassum powder in the treatment is 5, 10, and 15 percent. Sargassum medical powder was prepared by collecting it, dry, washed thoroughly, and dried for three days. It has 80.99 percent dry matter and 18.77 percent of moisture. It was pulverized using mortar and piso. Standard management and practices were adopted during the conduct of the study until it was terminated. Birds were submitted to 12 hours of light daily and eggs were collected daily in the morning. The data gathered in this study are a weight, which measure, being measured by digital analytical balance, a length and a width measured using a digital linear caliper. The percent shape index was measured by dividing the egg width and the egg length multiplied by 100. The shell thickness was measured using a digital micrometer. 
Here the way it was measured using a digital analytical balance and percent shell ratio was measured by dividing the shell weight by the egg weight multiplied by 100. The data gathered, they were analyzed using one-way analysis of variance or the ANOVA. The significant differences among treatment means were determined using the case honestly significant difference. And the result of our study, egg weight at 5% supplementation of sargassum powder got the highest mean average. So it is shown in this graph. It has 10.46 grams, followed by the 10% sargassum powder supplementation and the 15% sargassum supplementation. It was observed that the supplementation of sargassum powder with 14.6 calcium content inversely affects the egg weight of the quails. However, the data revealed no significant differences among and the egg weight of quails on the different levels of sargassum powder supplementation. The egg length was recorded highest at 5% supplementation of sargassum powder. The data signified that feeds with sargassum powder at 5%, 10%, and 15% levels of supplementation was recorded higher in egg length compared to pure commercial diet. The results mean that sargassum powder as supplement has contributed to the physical traits of quail eggs in terms of length. Egg with results follows the same, the same trend as of egg length. It was observed that eggs produced by quails with sargassum supplementation at a different level are slightly wider than those produced by the quail with pure commercial feed diet. So it is shown in this graph. The egg shape index observed that pure commercial diet has higher on average mean than the sargassum powder supplementation. So it is not a result. The data indicates that egg produced with sargassum supplementation were lower in shape index than the feed with pure commercial diet. The result of supplementation of sargassum powder with calcium content of 14.6% ranges the egg shape index from 79.30 to 79.87 and the egg was characterized as round egg. The egg shell thickness. So egg shell work as a package of the egg content. It must be sufficiently strong to resist pressure during laying, breeding, and transporting until it reaches to the final consumer. So in this data, supplementation of sargassum powder at 5% level got the highest recorded value in egg shell thickness. The results signify that supplementing sargassum powder has a comparable result to commercial feed in terms of shell thickness. There were no significant difference found in the shell thickness of quail and different levels of sargassum supplementation. This result suggests that supplementation of sargassum powder improved the shell thickness as the birds get older. The egg shell weight, it was recorded high in 5% in supplementation. But analysis showed that there was no significant difference on the egg shell weight of quails different on the different level supplementation of sargassum powder with 14.6% of calcium. The increasing of shell weight suggests that calcium rich feed supplements help to maintain shell weight as the birds are getting older. From the result of our study, we concluded that the supplementation of sargassum powder at 5% level provide an interesting result on the external quality of quail eggs such as egg weight, egg length, egg width, egg shell thickness, and egg shell weight. Therefore, supplementation of sargassum powder from 5% up to 15% level have positive effects on the external egg quality traits of quail 
particularly at mid late laying stage. And from that, we recommended that a nutritional analysis of the quail egg feed with varying level of sargassum supplements should be conducted in order to validate if there is a positive or negative effect on the nutritional composition of the egg and conduct related study to other poultry species in order to further discover the potential of sargassum as feed supplement. That's all with my presentation and thank you. That was Mary Coney S. Inso from Southern Leyte State University. But before we proceed to our Q&A, let me remind our presenters with this note that if your recorded video goes beyond 10 minutes, our technical committee will cut off um, your video presentation in order for us to follow our rules on uh, this conference. Once again, your video must only be 10 minutes. Okay, so now let's proceed to our Q&A portion. So I hope that Miss Mary Goni is, in, is around and is ready to answer the question of our evaluator. Be evaluating your uh, research presentation. We have Dr. Riz Rupert L. Ortiz. Dr. Ortiz, can we hear um, your voice, sir, here in our room? Uh, yes, good morning. Um, a pleasant morning to everyone. Uh, Sir. Likewise to our, uh, my fellow evaluators of this track, um, and to all the presenters of today's uh, activity. Uh, is Mom Mary around? Yes. Good morning, Mom Mary. Yes, good Thank morning. you for your presentation. Um, I understand that Poultry production is an essential area of the agricultural economy. Um, there are interest in the sources, novel sources of feed additives that will improve production performance and poultry health. Um, your research focuses on the application of seaweeds as feed additive or feed material. Okay, so. Over the internet, I've tried reading some of the literature. Um, my question is, um, how would you describe the seaweeds in Sugut Bay? Are they different or similar to the other uh, seaweed species? They are similar in other seaweed species in the Philippines, right? They are different or similar? They are similar. Similar. Uh, I thought there is something different from the the species in in Sugut Bay. Okay. Anyway, um, second is in your experiments you use sixty heads of laying quails, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you you have you had uh, experimental and control groups over the period of twenty eight days. Um, yes, may I know why only twenty eight days? because we only want to test if there is an effect of that supplement to the egg, sir. And uh, so over the period of less than a month, you were able to derive or you, you were able to get the necessary information from your experiments? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, so last time, uh, uh, some of the literature, uh, they involved around um, three to six months for the experiments. But in your case, you only have it for less than a month experiment. Okay. Anyway, was, um, with your experiments... Also... Yeah, yeah, go on, uh, Mom Mary, Professor Mary. Um, because during our experiments, right, it was the time that lockdowns are already and um, imposed in our place. So that's why we only took the one month data for our experiment. Uh, I see, okay. So from your experiments, uh, which treatment returned the best result? 
for the egg quality it and was, can you explain it why it was the five percent level of sargassum supplement sir it showed best result maybe because so hello 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 am i there yeah, yeah, we can hear you, madam. Uh, uh, okay. So it was the 5% level of sargassum showed the best result, sir. Uh, can you explain why? Because, maybe because it's, it's the right level for the improvement of the shell thickness and the other external egg quality traits of um, Japanese quail, but the rest of the treatment, 10% and 15 sargassum also showed good result that is comparable to pure commercial diet, sir. Okay, so I think we also have Sir Haris Tarayo. Uh, he will be asking a few questions also. Sir Haris? Sir, Sir Haris, are you around? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yeah, sir, Harris is one of the center director in our university. So, uh, my question for you, ma'am, is what are the things we need to consider when preparing sargassum muticum as feed supplement? The Because this sargassum muticum is seasonal in only in the Philippines, so I guess there is one thing to consider in preparing sargassumaticum powder. Uh, what about, ma'am, uh, the process on how you prepare the pulverized uh, powder of the said seaweed? Um, the process, it must be dried for three days or it can also be done in air dry. Well, okay, ma'am, that would be all. Okay, thank you so much. So, I guess um, the questions were already given and uh, addressed to ma'am Mary, uh, Mary Coney S. And so, thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz and Sir Harris Tarayo, for your. Um, expertise, of course, on uh, the presentation. Thank you, Sir Jeff, and Thank congratulations you. to um, Professor Mary. Yes, yes. Thank you also, um, Mama Mary, for presenting your research paper. A reminder to, uh, of course, to our evaluators also, if uh, you have further questions or follow-up questions, when our time is already beyond five minutes, you might comment down your questions on our chat room, okay? So let's uh, proceed to our next presenter. He is from Jose Rizal Memorial State University, and his research paper is entitled Clustering Poverty Incidents Based on Social Indicators. Without much further ado, let's welcome Mr. Ed Neil Omaratas. Everyone, have a good day. And uh, to especially to the participants and my co-researchers and to the organizers of the second International Conference on Poverty Elevation and Sustainable Development. I am Ed Neil Omaratas and a researcher from the College of Arts and Sciences of Osirisal Memorial State University, main campus, Lapitan City, would like to present my paper entitled Clustering Poverty Incidents Based on Social Indicators. To start with, may I present the background of my study. Uh, each country has a predominant goal of progress and hard work that is to improve the quality of life of their public. Uh, but however, poverty and disparity have remained persistent challenges in the Philippines. The Philippines has its pledge to work heading towards poverty reduction. Had some of the goals on you are on human progress and scarcity reduction, which are which aim at keeping poverty in every area of the nation. Notwithstanding all those diagnosing poverty 
advances and formulating various approaches and financial development strategy agendas for its reduction, but the government is still meeting high levels of poverty and hunger among its citizens. According to Philippine Statistical Authority 2015, there are about 21% of Filipinos who live in poverty, and with that, of the top poorest provinces in the country as of 2015, Sambuanga del Norte ranked top 8 with a poverty incidence of 56.1%. Sambonga del Norte is located in the uh, Region 9, is devoted to agriculture and has rich in marine and mineral resources. Despite the richness of the province, but the individuals living is still longing to get out of poverty. Thus, there remains the need to conduct a study identifying specific indicators that would lead to poverty in the province. Recognizing the gauges in, uh, uh, that pace greater on poverty, Incidence is very essential in the preparation of strategy papers on poverty issues and policy alternatives. To capitalize on the outcome of any poverty alleviation program, one must consider the proper identification of priority areas, proper clustering algorithm um, is very important. No? And uh, thus, the researcher is highly motivated to conduct this study clustering poverty incidents based on social indicators. And uh, this paper utilized a cluster analysis to group similar observations with number of clusters based on observed values. The objectives of this study aim to cluster poverty incidents based on social indicators in the province. And it seeks it's so to determine the following, the status of poverty incidents uh, of the province, to determine which municipalities of the province have common latest in terms of poverty incidence and social indicators, and also to uh, determine the social indicators that relate to poverty incidence of the province. And these are the methodology. They, it utilizes data mining techniques, correlational method of research. It uses secondary data, and the data are taken from the Department of Education, um, National Statistics Office, latest how population housing survey, Department of Health, Nutrition Council, and Police Provincial Office. The social indicators include demography, health and sanitation, housing and tenure, and governance. And the statistical tool used in this study, cluster and regression analysis, and this are set at 0.05 level of significance. The results and discussion of this paper, the first objective of this uh, paper is to determine the status of poverty of the province of Subanga del Norte. The distribution of 25 municipalities and two cities in the province of Subanga del Norte is presented in figure 1. Um, the, 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 each district has a share of municipalities and cities. The top five poorest municipalities are Shayan, Kutalak, Siboko, Baligian, and Osidalman. Majority of the poor municipalities are actually situated in this district, District 3. And one of the reasons why they remain poor is because of the presence of the rebel groups in the area. And, uh, uh that is, therefore, uh, we could say that the cost of living of the household very is, is are very low no? um, compared to other municipalities in the, the province of Sabanga del Norte. <clears throat> and can, they cannot afford their basic food and health needs and cannot sustain engagement in economic activities. Given this very high poverty incidence, needless to mention that the local government of Sabanga del Norte should make concerted effort to strengthen the interventions to curb the growing public concern of poverty, especially those municipalities that are high that have high high positive um high poverty incidence acas 2014 stress out that majority of the poorest municipality uh, came from the third district of the province of Samanga del Norte. Second uh, objective is uh, to look at uh, which municipalities or cities of the province of communities in terms of poverty incidence and social indicators. Table 1 uh, presents the clustering of municipalities with common poverty incidence and social indicators. Municipalities tend to cluster together into common characteristics of poverty which are relatively homogeneous. After doing cluster analysis and uh, <clears throat> very uh, using the distance, the data showed uh, two municipalities and one city group in cluster 1 and one city in cluster 2, and there are 24 municipalities cl group in cluster 3. Cluster 3 contains a set of municipalities with higher poverty incidence and other social indicators. These are high um, household with no sanitary toilet, uh, high access to potable water, proportion of household, uh, high crime rate, uh, high percentage of children, and uh, low access to um, housing unit and 
with no lot owned and high litera uh, low literacy rate okay and this in this uh, um, municipality if uh, they have if the municipality has a smaller number of households sent to school and no access to safe water, the more the higher poverty incidence. If that the most of the municip with this most municipalities in the group are dominated and known as the home of militant group. According to Asian Development Bank, poverty incidence is correlated with educational attainment of the household and also family size is possibly correlated with poverty incidence and vulnerability. With that, the local government of Sambanga de Norte must find ways in keeping in coping those hindrances of poverty in certain municipalities for the household to improve their way of living and to get out of poverty the third objective of this paper is to identify social indicators that relate to poverty incidence of the province presented in table two is the progression regression analysis between poverty incidence and social indicators it can be uh, look at it can be uh, gleaned from the table that the p value of the t test for each predictor variable um, household with no sanitary toilet uh, has a fee value less than 0 0.05. Uh, of a certain municipality contributes a significant relationship to the model. It can be interpreted that for every household with no sanitary toilet in the locality uh, is associated with 40.69% in poverty incidence. Sanitation toilet is important to unlocking social and economic progress of a certain community in order to save lives of thousands of children and uh, according to Times of India, that India, that India Times that comb 2016, sanitation is a significant factor to every human being to prevent from any illnesses, and it is also important for survival and development of people around the world, especially the exposure to human waste causes disease. <clears throat> Looking at the R squared value, 79.3 percent, which is relatively higher, which indicates the best uh, model, better model fits the data, which means that 79 percent. 79.3% of the variation in poverty incidence are explained by the social indicators presented in the model. The conclusions and recommendations of this study, poor municipalities dense in the third district, no, less access to safe water, low literacy rate, less access to safe water, housing unit and lack of ownership on a poor household in the province, cannot afford their basic needs, food and health, therefore cannot sustain the engagement in economic activities. Lack of knowledge, the household cannot identify assert, and assert their needs in their day-to-day -day living. The, due to the remoteness of their area, absence of basic services, non-government organization cooperatives, external assistance to handle emergencies, and lack of contact with government leaders. Poor households have constant a struggle to afford food and health care, leaving them no time of or energy to form or join organizations to strengthen their position in society. Poor health and sanitation may lead to increase the chances of exposure to many illnesses and diseases and may lead to turn traps the community to poverty. Majority of the household in the province is still hoping to be provided with basic ne necessary uh, basic needs from the local government units, particularly those with high poverty incidence. Need to mention that regional and local governments should make concerted efforts to strengthen poverty programs to uh, um, eliminate poverty. A health and sanitation program of the regional and local government must be strengthened. And the national government recognized the need for sustainability and regular update of the poverty estimates. Lastly, future work is needed to improve the analysis of poverty incidence and its significant factors using primary data survey. And that's all. Thank you and mabuhay. God bless us all. That was Mr. Ed Neil Omaratas from Jose Rizal State University. Now let's proceed to the Q&A portion, five minute Q&A portion. And uh, let's welcome our evaluator, Dr. Maria Victoria Naboya. Dr. Naboya. Um, ma'am, we can't okay. hear you uh, yes, from sir. our... Um, okay. okay, you're loud and clear, ma'am. Okay. Am I already heard? What do you want to do? Sir, I'm, sir Jeff, am I already heard? Um, uh, yeah. Is it clear? Yes, ma'am, you're loud okay. and clear. So we can hear you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Congratulations to the proponent of the study. Sir, my question is just... Okay. Okay. 
Uh, there are uniqueness in every municipality comprising Sambuanga del Norte as a province. So you are trying to cluster the poverty incidence with certain criteria. My question is, does it not create a bias to really see the real picture of the poverty incidence in the province, considering that each municipality or each city comprising the province possesses certain social uh, characteristics? Hello, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you for that question, ma'am. Hello. Yes, sir. Just continue. I can hear you. Um, I think there is no bias for that uh, um, analysis, ma'am, in clustering the poverty incidents uh, of the province of Sambuanga del Norte. Uh, yeah, because you you did you did data mining, right, sir? And may I ask, what was duration? Was what was the duration? How many years were the data that you have used to? Um, ma'am, that was uh, 2015 data from the Philippine Statistics Authority, ma'am. So 2015. Yes, ma'am. Considering that this is now 2020, so that, more that, or less, yes. uh, we can already see yes, the picture of that. Yes. Okay. Um, that was just my concern on on the uniqueness of every municipality as to really see the data. So you will make a general, I mean, a generic uh, picture of the entire province, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Naboya. And also, we also congratulate Mr. Ed Neil O. Maratas for presenting your paper. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. So to our evaluator, Dr. Nambuya, if you have follow-up questions, you may comment it down to our chat box. Now, let's proceed to our next presenter. Um, but we will, we're will we going first to check if uh, this person is present or this presenter is present in our in our room. Um, uh, we have Pham Trong Nan from Vietnam. So I, I um, we guess that this this person is not yet around. So we're gonna proceed to our next presenter. The presenter is from Bulacan State University, Sarmiento Campus. And uh, also, he or she, um, I'm not really sure if this person is a woman or uh, a man, but he or she is going to present the paper entitled Unearthing State Eureka Fort, a Need Analysis. Let's welcome Henarita D. Miranda. innovative ways to help us present our study. Good day, everyone. I'm Henrietta Di Miranda, the lead researcher in this study. I'm from Bulacan State University, Sarmiento Campus. To start with my presentation, I would like to acknowledge the enormous help of these people. First, Dr. Sinaida J. Bendia, our former dean of the campus, for her unwavering support, especially in putting the concepts together. To Ms. Eleanor P. Paloma for her support during the data collection. 
I also want to thank our school, Bulacan State University, for the support in honing our professional lives. Of course, to the organizers of this conference, Summer State University, thank you so much for this opportunity. Despite the pandemic, you still came up with innovative ways to help us present our study. Last but not the least is the Almighty Father for endowing us the resources we need in every endeavor we take. Our study is entitled Unearthing Situ Ricafort, a Needs Analysis. This paper aimed to dig deep and turn over all aspects in the lives of the subject. As such, this paper focuses in unraveling the obscured and hidden truth concerning the lives of the people living in Situ Ricafort. This study was governed by objectives that we think were essential in uncovering the concerns of the residents. The first objective that we had was identifying the living conditions of the resident. Second, we wanted to know the existing source of income of the people. Third, we want to know the common issues they face. Fourth, we wanted to know the different kinds of help they are currently getting. And last, what sustainable project can be created for them. Let me just give you a sh short background of the place we are talking about. This place is located in San Jose del Monte, Bulacan, a highly urbanized area in which several establishments are found. The barangay that has jurisdiction with Sichu Rica Fort is Barangay Tungkung Manga and is considered to be one of the richest barangay in San Jose del Monte. Despite the economic affluence of Tungkung Manga, Sichu Rica Fort is still far from developing. The travel time to Sichu Rica Fort should only take 15 minutes to 20 minutes if the road is concretized. The road remains to be undeveloped for many reasons. As a result, transportation is scarce and very expensive. People are forced to travel on foot since motorcycles and other low-quality vehicles cannot endure the rocky and uneven road. The question here is, why did we choose this place? In fact, we didn't know about this place until our Vice President Research, Dr. Cecilia Geronimo, advised us to invite participants from Sichu Rica Fort for our yearly Sambalaran. Sambalaran is a program that provides training to the community surrounding the school. We saw the living condition of the place. Sichu Rica Fort has only one story building with four rooms as a school. It is even multi-graded. We saw the need to help this community and capacitate the people. But before we can craft any propositions, we needed to know their needs. Hence, we conducted this study. In order to ensure our study will cover all the aspects that we needed, we collected the data in three different ways. The first collection data process was the focus group discussion or FGD in which we asked some questions as prompters. These prompters invoke the residents to speak about their feelings. The set of prompters that we used were researcher made. Additionally, we also conducted an interview with the residents. The guide questions were researcher made as well. The last step that we did was to collect the data through an instrument crafted by the Uni University Extension Office. This instrument, on the other hand, was standardized and validated. In analyzing the data, we made use of themes. We grouped the answers based on the governing themes that, were, that we discovered. The sources of data were the residents and the barangay officials. The primary source of the data were the residents themselves. The community has 61 households based on the list given by their mother leader. The study was able to cover all households through the FGD interview and survey. The study also included the barangay officials of Tungkong Manga because they can strengthen and validate the information collected. Tungkong Manga officials collaborated in this paper because they want to get the results so they can craft resolutions and projects for the residents. The data collected from the FGD interview and survey are as follows. For the first problem, most houses were built using light materials. Even their multi-purpose hall is poorly built. It serves as a chapel, meeting area, and as a venue of other community activities. For the second issue, source of income, the people mostly rely on the temporary employment they get from the city. 
They work in establishments as contractuals. Being a nanny or vendor are the common works for women, and for men, they work as construction workers. The community produces banana chips, but the market for these chips is just simply within the community. They have limited access in marketing. Additionally, participants avail government projects such as 4Ps. All of the households are included in 4Ps. They also have seasonal help from NGOs, especially during Christmas. For the last objective, the residents stated that they suffer from poor transportation, poor education, and land dispute. Therefore, the study was able to conclude that there are three major culprits that prevent the residents from achieving progress, which are mainly poor transportation, land dispute, and economic issues. Because researchers cannot address the top two identified problems, we decided to focus on capacitating the residents through livelihood projects. So we developed the Sakabai, Takasabai and Nangbulsu SC. This is a project capacitating the uh, people in Sichurika Ford. This will be done regularly by the faculty members. The knowledge and skills that the residents need in establishing income will be achieved through the series of trainings that will be conducted under the Kasabay. Kasabay stands for Kaagapay sa Barangay and it is a three-year program. This is composed of six phases in which each phase corresponds to six months. Personality de development is the first stage. It focuses on developing the mindset, especially in interpersonal relationships. The project believes the training potential millionaire starts in a personality and mindset. Business and financial literacy, in, on the other hand, is the second stage. It focuses on capacitating the participants through increased knowledge in potentially income-generating skills such as soap making, chips and bread making, food preservation, crocheting, Christmas decor making, and t-shirt printing. The final stage of the paradigm is the motivation. This stage employs both collaborating parties, which is the Bulacan State University and Barangay Tungkung Manga. In this stage, participants will be guided in maintaining and expanding the skills given to them. Incorporated between activities will be the feedback. This is an important factor since it will measure the success of the project. This can be a basis whether there will be changes made in the program. With this, Bulacan State University Sarmiento Campus signed a three-year memorandum agreement that bind Bulacan State University and Barangay Tungkung Manga. The project, though, had been affected by the pandemic. Still, the implementation will continue. The implementers must conduct seminars through video conferencing and other ways of modality. This project should also adapt the new normal. But due to the pandemic, necessary and drastic changes had been made to the program. Seminars and trainings will then be delivered through recordings and self-paced modules. Currently, Kasabay ng Bulso SE became the flagship program at the campus. Nearby barangays also adapted the program. We are still far from completing the project, but we believe that, if, that when everyone is dedicated in achieving the goal, no big problems can ever stop us. With that, we summarize our study. I'm very happy with this opportunity to talk about our paper. Thank you so much for listening. Damong salamat ha iyong matanan. That was Miss Henrietta Di Miranda from Khan State University. Ma'am, your evaluator is Dr. Ortiz, and I hope you're now ready to address the evaluator's questions. Dr. Ortiz, once again, may we hear from you, sir? Yes, uh, Sir Jeff. Uh, Professor Miranda, good morning. I, yes, uh, yes, Doc. Uh, good morning. Morning. Uh, I hope you're doing fine. Uh, yes, I am. Good. I'm, I'm great, Doc. Okay, so going through the paper, uh, I realized that this is a research and extension program of Bulacan State University. Am I right? Uh, yes, uh, yes, that is correct, Doc. Uh, I have just been recently um, designated as the new um, 
Community Extension Service Unit head, and that's the reason why I uh, crafted this kind of uh, of research and extension program. So uh, just to ensure that uh, we will be able to craft at least a three-year to five-year uh, um, project. Ah, congratulations on your new designa designation. Um, <laughs> yes, my question you. is, um, since this is an extension project also, may we know what businesses or skills trainings that you are planning to give to the residents of CTO uh, Rica Fort? Um, um, based on the paradigm that we have uh, crafted, the, um, the, the uh, program is a three-year uh, program. The first year is uh, more on a personality development because uh, we believe that uh, for uh, people to be able to sustain um, economic growth, there should be uh, development in themselves. So that's why we developed the uh, first year. We currently are in the first year. And so that we are focusing now on uh, personality. So next year, what we are in storing is uh, for uh, uh, for with this uh, projects that are going to be income generating, such as um, um, since they already have banana chips making, we just intend to improve it, sustain it. And uh, we have the um, um, dishwashing, we have the um, conditioning, uh, fabric conditioner, we also have um, perfume making. I, I actually listed in uh, the paper the program. I included in the paper the program that uh, we are uh, going to include. Yeah, okay. So uh, I think uh, Sir Harris also has some or a few questions. Sir Harris, please. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Uh, yes, hi, sir. Uh, hi, sir, Harris. Uh, uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, my, uh, my question for you is this. Uh, what factors might affect or inhibit the conduct of the project, and how do you plan on addressing them? Um, tentatively, the problem that we really are facing in, uh, in implementing this is the land dispute. The land dispute that they care, uh, that the people are currently um, facing is um, rooted with the uh, agrarian reform. So the uh, the land is currently uh, being um, um, claimed by uh, a certain uh, rich uh, family, and so they have uh, already um, placed checkpoints, and that that can limit the accessibility of the area. Hence, uh, the uh, the solution that we are um, having is that we always communicate with the barangay officials so that we can uh, be uh, driven to the place and uh, be um, be uh, uh, be assisted in uh, getting access because the area is, uh, I mean, the only possible way of uh, going there is through the Barangay official mobile car. So uh, we really uh, need to ask uh, to get help from the, um, uh, from the Barangay officials. Uh, okay, Th thank you very much, ma'am. Another one is, uh, the other one is, aside from helping develop the personality of the residents in City Eureka Fort, uh, are there any other specific strategies that you will apply in order to ensure the sustainability of the project? Um, as we uh, see, uh, in order for us to um, sustain, since this is a three-year project, that's why we def uh, uh, we uh, devised the uh, d uh, what's this the paradigm with feedback because feedback here plays an important role the feedback is going to give us um, an assessment whether what we are doing right now is in need of uh, uh, changes depending on the uh, the feedback given by the participants or by uh, the people in situ rica ford hence uh, we are still um, on the process this actually is a uh, a kind of project, sir, that uh, will uh, be dynamic because of the feedback. We are going to change it according to the needs of the uh, people. Now, uh, giving example is that uh, since we are uh, now in the pandemic, the uh, the program has uh, already uh, changed, meaning um, all our projects will be delivered through um, 
recorded videos modules so uh, so that it can also be uh, it can also be uh, even though there's a problem with the pandemic we are still able to continue with the uh, with the program okay that would be all professor miranda thank you very much thank you so much as well you're welcome thank you professor miranda thank you. congratulations on your presentation yeah, thank you Thank you, Dr. Ortiz and Sir Harris Tarayo, and also congratulations to Ma'am Hinerita Miranda for presenting your paper. We are down to our fourth presenter. He is from Visaya State paper entitled Security Through Diversification of Renewable Energy Sources in Developing Countries. Let's welcome Mr. Moses Neil B. Serenio. Science State University located here in Bye Bye City, Leyte. Today, I'll be sharing with you our uh, paper entitled Energy Security Through Diversification of Renewable Energy Sources in Developing Countries. The increasing diversity of renewable energy sources in developing countries has been receiving increasing attention concerning the issue of future energy security and climate change. Now, given that there is a strong relationship between energy demand and economic growth, the discussions about renewable energy has become more relevant in the issue of climate change. Now let me share with you my screen. Um, for the past century, the economic activities heavily relied on fossil fuels and it gravely affected our climate system. The IPCC reported that it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the recent climate change, particularly the alarming concentration of um, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions in the atmosphere. In fact, for the first time in history in 2007, uh, the aggregate emissions from the developing countries surpassed that of the developed countries. So today's policymakers are confronted with the challenge of stabilizing the climate system without hindering economic growth. Because for developing countries, um, majority or a lot of those who are below poverty line are located in developing countries and limiting their economic opportunities could further um, jeopardize efforts in trying to um, attain one of the sustainable development goals of uh, achieving zero poverty. So in this connection, renewable um, energy is one of the feasible approaches explored in this study to fuel economic activities. Uh, renewable energy can augment the need for energy, uh, it can also provide energy security because uh, these sources will be available locally. Though conventional fuels are still the primary uh, source of energy, the renewable energy has been um, increasing its share in the total energy mix of the developing countries. Now, um, however, besides its um, advantage of reducing carbon emissions, uh, there are also socioeconomic benefits derived from um, renewable energy. And if you notice, there is an increasing trend of um, energy mix of renewable energy in developing countries from 13% to around 19%. Now, uh, this paper tries to promote uh, diversification, and this will contribute uh, to the discussion on the concept of um, achieving uh, energy security in developing countries. Why diversification? Like in business, it is very crucial that we'll have a diversified portfolio in order to manage risk and volatility. The saying, do not put all your eggs in one basket is actually an indication of uh, diversification. It is very similar with renewable energy because most renewable energies rely on the weather, natural source, and natural um, environment as the main source of energy such as the wind, sun, water, wave, etc. And these are unpredictable. Hence, diversification can help achieve a steady and reliable source of energy. Now, uh, Lee argued that diversification and localization of energy sources are essential so that we can promote sustainable development as well as achieve energy security. Now, he stressed further that the idea of diversified energy is not just good for the people, but it's also good for the environment. 
for example, um, if you look at biodiversity, it's actually good for the environment. So the same with diversified portfolio, it's good for investment. So as diversified energy, it is good to achieve a stable source and reliable source of energy supply. Uh, because again, the main disadvantage of um, especially non-hydro renewable energy because of its varied source. So if it's uh, stormy, so energy from solar may not be reliable, but if you have uh, wind, then during stormy weather, this can generate more energy. So a mix between all these available sources of non-hydro renewable energy will be good for achieving a sustainable and reliable source of energy and it is in this direction that we actually look at diversification of renewable energy so the main theory where this study is anchored on is on the environmental kuznets curve wherein kuznets proposes an inverse um, u-shaped type of relationship that for a given society environmental pressure is expected to increase at the early stages of growth where you can think of this one as um, maximizing the use of fossil fuels but eventually we will reach a peak and then um, environmental pressure or environmental degradation will tend to decline as society choose to uh, fuel economic activities with cleaner sources of energy and this is what we are trying to determine whether that pattern is achievable among developing countries in the context of diversification. Now, um, how to do this one? So, um, our methods of measuring diversification uh, is uh, two parts. So first, we have uh, we'll be proposing a new index of diversification wherein, if a, re uh, a developing country is, uh, did not invest in any source of renewable energy, its its value is zero. But if it invested into in renewable energy into a variety form, so that's more than zero, we will weigh that total energy generated from that particular source over the total renewable energy generated. And to investigate this one, we will be using Poisson model. Uh, this is for count data and also negative binomial for count data. So we will model this one as a two-stage selection. First, we would ask our developing countries investing in renewable energy. So that is one, if they, they have renewable energy, or they invested into renewable energy and zero if they've heavily relied on fossil fuels and then from those who invested we asked the question do they diversify so that means do they only rely in one source or they rely in two or three particular source so that they'll be achieving energy security through diversification so that's the main point that we are trying to look at now if you look at initial graph and goodness of fit for our analysis, you notice here that there are still a lot of countries that did not invest in um, renewable energy. That's zero and one sources, two sources, three sources, and four sources. So it's a, a declining trend that there are very few countries invested in four variety of sources. Now, how do we analyze this one? So for count data, there are so many available options. We can have negative binomial and also our um, uh, Poisson model so we'll be exploring all those methods and in addition uh, the two-stage analysis will be using what we call the two parts model okay briefly we look at our um, result here we notice that from 1980 to 2010 there has been an increasing adoption of this new type of sources of energy like wind solar geothermal and biomass so we can say that there are several countries that have already diversified in 2010, adapting various forms of non-hydro sources of energy. Now, this is our result. It's a big table, but let me just zoom it for you. Let me just highlight some of the figures. So first, our idea whether um, environmental Kuznets curve is relevant in developing countries, and this can be achieved by looking at here in our income sources. So income is a measure of our um, income is captured through GDP. It's a proxy for for income and we have the square term to look at nonlinearity. So if you notice the first stage is negative so that means it's actually declining so that means diversification and use of renewable energy declines but as the 
uh, developing country progresses, the square term is positive, it actually increases. So you see this one is a U-shaped form of relationship. It's the inverse of what we are proposing because our dependent variable is not environmental degradation, but it's the other way around. We captured this one in terms of diversification. And since we have negative and positive sign, it shows that through time, developing countries tend to diversify sources of renewable energy as a way of achieving energy security and stabilizing uh, sources for uh, renewable energy. Now, if you look at Kyoto Protocol, these are international discussions in terms of curbing emissions. And one of the innovations with Kyoto Protocol is um, the clean development mechanisms that developing countries are given incentive if they adopted clean development mechanisms, and one of which is in terms of renewable energy. And consistently across... That was Mr. Moses Neil Sereno from Visaya State University. For the Q&A, we have Dr. Naboya. Ma'am? Okay, good. Is, is Mr. Sereno the presenter around? Sir, are you around or you are you think he was disconnected? Hello, sir. Hello, sir, Sereno. Hello, sir. Is he still? Can we hear from Mr. Moses? I think he was disconnected, sir. Ah, uh, Mr. Moses Sereno is disconnected, I guess, yes. also, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um. So, can we just have? Okay. I guess he he's was, now around them. Yeah, he was not yet done with the presentation, I think. Oh, yes, I'm because um, ah, according to the protocol of our presentation, huh? if the, the video presentation goes beyond 10 minutes, ma'am, um, the video will be oh, cut okay. off. So he, is he around now? Yes, ma'am, I'm around. And unfortunately, I cannot unmute myself, but now I'm... It's, oh, okay. It's okay Let's so, welcome Mr. Sereno. Yeah, uh, your your study is so interesting, but considering that when you try to look into the literature, there are already a lot of studies dealing on this. But my question is, what makes your study unique and what would be the impact of this study to the society if in case this will be used? Yes, that's, that's true that there has been increasing attention to renewable energy as a way to um, augment the need for further energy and to fuel economic growth because the claim more now to reduce emission and renewable energy is one way of fueling economic activities and reducing emission. Much of the discussion in the literature on renewable energy is focused on policy in terms of generation, in terms of technology, and our paper proposes one way of looking at issues that has not been addressed uh, substantially in terms of diversification. So available literature, what we can observe, I think it was Lee 2005 who started um, featuring that diversification is one way to address um, the disadvantage of renewable energy that you don't have reliable energy supply. So in terms of solar energy, that means you're dependent with the intensity and heat of the sun. And if it's cloudy and stormy, then your energy generated it will lower if you're coming in uh, temperate countries, then during winter time, solar energy would be lesser. So that that can be augmented by looking at other sources like wave and also the, the wind energy. So in terms of impact, it contributes to the macroeconomic, macroeconomic level of policy discussion that one way to forge so that people would not be afraid in terms of the reliability of energy supply is to diversify sources so that uh, you can pull from different sources. So, for example, for Philippines, if we are stormy or if there are typhoons, so from solar may not be good, but wind energy would be substantial in that case. So at least we get to have stable supply. Okay, thank you, Sir Moises. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I guess uh, that was um, the conclusion of the Q&A. Well, thank you, Dr. Naboya, and congratulations, uh, sir.
um, Sir Serenio, for presenting your paper. Sir, as much as we want to hear the whole content of uh, your paper, but due to time protocols of this conference, immediately proceed to the Q&A. Sir? No problem. I'm actually heading to the conclusion. This poverty conference? <laughs> okay, okay, sir. Thank you for understanding, sir, sir Neil. This poverty conference is extending its wings beyond the borders of the Philippine Islands. Through international collaborations, we are able to have presenters from other countries. He is from Dong Tap University, Vietnam. And this paper in, is entitled Women Towards Micro-Edit Savings Models of Poor Women in Vintan Commune, Cholac District, Bentri Province. Let's all welcome Mr. Lee Van Tien. Lee Van Tien from Dr. Hap University, Vietnam. And today I would like to present my paper with the title The Perspectives of Women Towards Microcredit Savings Models of the Poor Women in Vinhan Kamil, Jalat District, Benjia Province, Vietnam. And first of all, I would like to present the introduction now I would like to mention the definition of microcredit saving. Microcredit saving is the provision of financial services such as credit, deposit, payment, insurance, and other services to low-income groups in the society with the purpose of helping them develop their production and business and improve the quality of life. For poor women, microcredit saving provides financial products and services to poor communities in general and women in particular, which helps them improve their lives and develop their economic status and contributes to the development of society. In particular, the microcredit saving program mainly focuses on women, thus contributing to gender equality. In addition, women have been making a significant contribution to family finances and giving them more rights in family and social affairs. Now I would like to move on to objectives. The research aims to explore the views of women interviewed towards this model, including advantages and disadvantages, knowledge of family financial management, and how to save money when participating in the model. Then some conclusions and suggestions from the practical results will be recommended for groups of poor women in similar circumstances. And for methodology, the methodology was utilized in this study is qualitative research method. Study suggests are women, they are farmers aged from 25 to 55 years old in Vintan, Kamil Jalat District, Benche Province in the Mekong Delta region. The reason for choosing the respondents age from 25 to 55 years is because they are in their working age and are one of the two main employees in the family and they generate income and developed the family economy. The respondents are from 25 to 55 years old because they are working age and have the demand for borrowing money and saving money. Now I would like to present some results from this research. First, most women interviewed who participated in this model since the first day of the model establishment. The results show that this model is suitable for women who are farmers 
in rural areas and the loans are suitable with their ability to pay back and help them develop their family economy. All women interviewed said that since joining this model, their family economy has changed more positively than before because they received loans to develop family economy. They said that in the past, this area was very poor since the model was introduced. The women participating in the model was being able to loan and develop their family income. They introduced other low-income women to join in the first days. We saved only 20,000 per month, only loaned 2 million Vietnam dong per person. Then there was more and more capital to invest in the business, so the family economy was better. And all the participants also expressed that since joining this model, they have more understanding of how to use loans, learning how to save money, especially every month. The group meets every month, so the members of the group have the opportunity to share with each other their experience in capital management and how to use capital, how to save more money. And they also express that they received a lot of advantages after joining this model. All the women agreed that this model brings economic benefits, helps them and their family develop their family economy, and knows how to manage and use loans for the right purposes. How they also know how to save money to investment for the future. Most of the women said that it was difficult to borrow someone before joining the group. The group gave a loan easily with their credit and does not need to mortgage at all, saving more money but also makes interest when depositing. The model also helps women to be more united in difficult times, share and learn from each other to develop family economy from which the rural area is more developed. And when they were asked about the difficulties when joining this model, all the participants said that the model brings economic benefits, helping them to promote their economic development and know how to manage and use loans for their right purposes, know how to save money to invest in the future without any difficulties or obstacles when joining this model. And a woman expressed that it is not difficult for the participants but for the executive board of the model because sometimes the borrower does not pay so the board has to come together and go to encourage that person to pay back. And now I would like to move on to conclusion and recommendation. The model of credit and savings in Bentria province is a successful credit and savings model, not only in terms of economy, but also help women, especially housewives and farmers, escape their poverty and have a stable life. In addition, social success is also to help and the people realize their own potential difficulties as well as the potential of the community so that the community can help and show its own problems. It is a model of community development 
that needs to be replicated and this is also an address for social work students to practice their career. In the context of COVID-19 pandemic, the role of local communities is very important to help people to overcome difficulties, not only economically, but also socially. Only community knows what problems they are facing, and only they can solve those difficulties through support in the community. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. That was Mr. Lee Van Tien. Mr. Tien, your yes. evaluator is Dr. Francis Anna C. And I hope you're now ready for the Q&A. Dr. C, you yes, can yes. initiate the question and answer, ma'am. Once again, let's welcome Dr. Francis Ann C. for the Q&A. Dr. C, are you around, ma'am? Yes, yes, I'm here. What is it? Dr. C, ma'am. Um, Mr. Tian, we'll just wait for your evaluator because Dr. Francis Ansi is not yet responding. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay, we have a question here from Dr. C. According to her, have you utilized this research output to the intended users? Again, have you utilized this research output to the intended users? Yes, Mr. Tian. Um, okay, can you repeat your question, please? Okay, I'll repeat the question. Have you yeah. utilized this research output to the intended users? Yes, yes. Um, okay, because for this research, we focus on the poor women in a village because, you know, in Vietnam, some uh, for some region, it is hard for women, especially the uh, poor women, to come to the bank and get a loan. So this model is uh, very suitable for them because for farmers, they are so afraid of coming to the bank because they don't know how to deal with the paperwork and it is one of the difficulties they have to face when they want to get a loan and when they join this um, model, they can easily get a loan from the members and with the capital, they can invest in their uh, garden in their crop and the intended um, the target um, group I we want to aim to is a poor poor people especially women okay so that was your answer well Dr. C has a follow-up question if uh, your output was able to um, to be applied to the intended yeah. users. Well, how was this applied, by the way, Mr. Tian? Um, uh, actually, um, we also appreciate the benefits of this model. So we would like to introduce to a lot of people so that uh, especially poor women in many regions in other um, parts of the world can apply this model, they can work, uh, they can form a group 
to react this model and then they will uh, send money together each month and then they can get get a capital every month they will to get a capital and so uh, uh, a member will have a certain capital to invest in their own businesses Okay, well, thank you so much, Mr. Tian, for answering the questions of Dr. C. And uh, yes. we congratulate you for presenting your paper all the way from Vietnam. Yeah. Well, the Philippines is waving its hand to your homeland. Congratulations. We are down to our last three presenters for uh, this session. And may I welcome to you or introduce to you oh. our next presenter. She is from Visaya State University. Yes. Her paper is entitled The Rapid Assessment on the Impact yes. of COVID-19 on the Vegetable Value mm. Value Change uh, Chain mm. in Bye Bye City Leyte. Let's welcome Miss mm. Hadasha and Bongat. I'm going to present our research study entitled A Rapid Assessment of the Impact of COVID-19 on the Vegetable Value Chain in Bye Bye City, Leyte. As stated by Rolando D., the Philippine economy is on a downward trajectory. The main culprit, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has also affected over 120 countries. COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented disruptions in the mobility of people, goods, and services. Several restrictions were enforced to help contain the spread of the deadly virus. While the food security was held up to date, the measures put in place to contain the spread of the virus are starting to disrupt the supply of agro-commodities. Despite all this, only the agriculture sector posted a positive contribution to the second quarter Philippine gross domestic product. This study aimed to assess the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the vegetable value chain in Bye Bye City Leyte. Specifically, the study aimed to determine the positive and the negative impacts of COVID-19 on vegetable value chain identify the strategies employed by the chain actors, and present interventions provided by the government and other enablers. Now for our methodology, mixed method was used in data gathering procedure such as face-to-face, -face, email, online, and phone interviews with a total number of 51 respondents. Key informants were purposefully selected based on the following criteria, their volume of productions and quantity traded as a means of livelihood, their regularity of production and trading operation, their economic and market orientation. The interview guide used in this study was based on the researcher's a priori understanding of the factors that would be important to the research process and prior knowledge of its distribution practices in Bye Bye Market Area and in Region 8. Primary data was collected using semi-structured interviews, while relevant information was also gathered from City Agriculture, um, Market Economic Enterprise Office, and secondary reports or secondary data from HR Value Chain Projects. This study was conducted at Bye Bye City Leyte for three weeks starting August 2020. Commodity focus includes various locally grown vegetables, primarily composed your peanut bit mix, such as talong, ampalaya, egg, um, tomato, cucumber, pechay, and okra. Value chain mapping was also based on the perspective of the key informant interviewed and formal interviews with chain actors. Now for the short profile of our study site, Bai Bai is considered as a first-class city in the province of Leyte. It has a population of 109,432 people based on 2015 census. It has a total area of 45,000 hectares. Predominantly, it is identified as an agri-fishery-based economy. And in terms of area planted, the top five commodities are coconut, abaca, rice, banana, and corn. 
Eastern Visayas is a net importer of assorted types of vegetables, and Bye Bye City is no different from all other demand centers in Region 8. For a quick snapshot of our farmer's profile, generally vegetable farmers in Bye Bye were male with an average age of 55 years old. Greater majority of the respondents are of 87% were married with an average household size of 4. The overall mean value of farming experience was 23 years and majority of the vegetable farms were situated between 1 to 10 kilometers away from the market. This map presents a distribution channel overview of the vegetable market in Bye Bye City during the COVID-19 pandemic. It shows the network of connections and linkages across players and the intermediaries responsible in the overall transit of vegetable products from the supply point to the final demand destination points in the city, within the city. In line with the Department of Agriculture's National Implementation of Plant Plan Plan Program, Bye Bye Local Government Unit and City Agriculture Office intensified vegetable production through Gulay na Sapat Pagkain para sa Lahat project. Additional 6 hectares of land were planted with assorted types of vegetables such as eggplant, bitter gourd, bottle gourd, tomato, sweet pepper, okra, and squash. Starting mid-June, the local fresh vegetables are predominantly sold in wet market and community market centers within the city. Wherein, the retail market remains the bigger market share attraction. The main entry points of vegetables in Bye Bye City are the general wholesalers and the viajidors. These are the dominant traders who are capable of assembling large volume of vegetables from Mindanao areas through truckloads of assorted agri-products from major wholesale markets such as Bangkerohan in Davao, Bulwa in Cagayan, and Carbon in Cebu. There is only one supermarket and one hypermarket servicing vegetables in Bye Bye. They tap concessionaire who buys Class A vegetables from various suppliers and sell them to customers inside supermarkets. While wet, markets retailers, wet market retailers generally retail fresh or pre-cut vegetables, and there are 81 registered stallholders in Bye Bye Market, 6 catering services, 5 hotel services, 10 restaurants, and not less than 50 eateries across the city. This is an illustration of inbound and outbound of mixed vegetables in Bye Bye before COVID-19 pandemic. While vegetable production in Leyte has been steadily increasing, production is highly variable. This is largely due to regular occurrence of typhoons and monsoon rains. Hence, Bye Bye City largely depend on imported vegetables from Cagayan, Bukidnon, Davao, Cebu, and other neighboring municipalities. Demand for vegetables in Bye Bye is larger than the capacity of the local vegetable farmers to produce. In general, inbound volume is 80% higher than the outbound volume for Bye Bye. On the outbound side, a chunk from its total volume of mixed vegetables were delivered to Palo, Alang-Alang, Haro, and Carigara Leyte. Wholesalers also allocated around 1 to 3 tons of mixed vegetables delivered to the southern part of Leyte. And by buy also ship commodities to Cebu such as ginger, squash, and other products. This makes Bye Bye a transshipment point of vegetables to other neighboring cities and municipalities. This is now an illustration of inbound and outbound of mixed vegetables in Bye Bye during COVID-19 pandemic. The logistics has become a lot more complicated due to corona crisis. There are more border controls which results in delays and lesser frequency of deliveries. Inter-regional trading was highly affected, wherein Bye Bye wholesalers and viajidors are reduced trading operations to outside Bye Bye and within Bye Bye, both in terms of volume and number of deliveries. This data shows the weekly average vegetable quantity traded within Bye Bye before and during quarantine period.
In general, the average quantity traded of assorted vegetables ordered per week largely reduced by an average of 59% from 41 tons of vegetables to 17 tons during quarantine period. This was partly because of the strict border requirements, curfew, and other logistic challenges. Decreased situations is recorded mostly on the imported vegetables and spices such as cauliflower, carrots, potatoes, onions. The demand situation has also been affected. This increased local production makes a quick turn of events. The local demand declines to result from non-tourism activities and closure of schools, canteens, eateries, and dine-in restaurants. Let me now present to you the positive and negative impact of COVID-19 pandemic across vegetable value chain players. Unfavorable impacts were indicated in red lines. The government imposed a lockdown in mid-March. This resulted in unprecedented disruptions on the agri-food supply chains and demand shocks. Precautions are being taken in the entire country and this includes implementation of curfew hours, 24-hour border checkpoints, 50% um, capacity allowance for public utility vehicles, no back riding policies, and only 25% allowance capacity for dine-in services. Restrictions were also placed over senior citizens 65 years old and above and youth 25 years old and below to leave their houses and many other precautionary measures. The market... That was Ms. Dasha Bongat from Visayas State University. For the Q&A portion, let's come once again, Dr. Francie. Ma'am, were you able to enter now our room? Okay. Hello, sir. Yes, sir, RJ. I'm here, but I'm sorry I cannot put on my video because I have a very intermittent signal, but I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, ma'am. You may now initiate ma'am the Q&A portion. I, sorry. Sir RJ, well, I'm sorry. Again, it's I'm Dasha. Dr. I thought uh, <laughs> you were referring to me. Sorry, Sir RJ. It's me, Dasha. And it's not the 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 the, the panel. <laughs> The panel reviewer, sorry again for that. So currently we are having um, a technical glitch, but once again, let's welcome Dr. C for the Q&A portion. Dr. C, um, yes, may you unmute, uh, yes. unmute your... Okay. Can I be yes, here now? You're now loud and clear. Yes, ma'am. I'm very you're good. Thanks, clear. God. No, thanks, God. So as early <laughs> as this time, I would like to congratulate SSU for a very successful despite of the challenges that, that we are facing right now. Indeed, it's still very successful. So congratulations to our presenter. So I have only one question for you. You have a good you have a good research output. However, I would like to ask whether this research output of yours is already utilized to the intended users. If it is being utilized, in what way that this is utilized to the um, intended users? Thank you very much. Good morning, Madam President. Yes, good morning, Dr. Anne. Thank you for the question. Good morning. Um, 
Thank you for that question. Actually, this research forms part a larger project, research project entitled um, Developing Vegetable Value Chain and Meeting Emerging Market Needs. It's a five-year project and one of its activities to assess a rapid market assessment of the existing vegetable value chains in Bye Bye. So based on the initial report that we got conducting this rapid market mini project... Excuse me, um, Mama Yes. Yes, sir. May I interrupt, ma'am? Ma'am, ah, yes. um, uh, I am told if uh, you can turn on your camera. Yes, I'm very sorry, sir, but I have a very intermittent signal right now. If I turn on my camera, I might be disrupting okay, okay. connection. I'm very sorry, sir. Okay, um, it is understood. Thank you. I'm very sorry. Can I proceed? Um, yes, um, going back to the question of Dr. Anne, again, this is in line with a five-year project, and we are still in our first-year project. But based on the rapid market assessment that we have identified in Bye Bye, we actually um, enabled to translate the results and forwarded, or actually, we're able to draft a memorandum of agreement with City Agriculture Office, the local government unit of Bye Bye, in terms of entry and exit of of the, the inbound and outbound of vegetables coming from different regions, as well as we were able to cluster different farmer associations so that we can program their production. One of the results of our study is the oversupply because of the plant, plant, plant program where, and also the households um, increase engagement on the, the home gardening activities. So because of that, the market chain was actually disrupted. So, so to the commercial farmers, we we were able to identify farmer associations that we actually um, organize and advise to have a clustered program. So it's an ongoing activity to have um, um, clustered barangays with, with identified um, commodities to produce in a certain time to avoid oversupply. And again, this is an, an still an ongoing project that is a five-year project, so we still have a lot of lot of things to do. We are also um, implementing, car we're currently also initiating the training programs and capacity building of our farmer associations. And in terms of market traders, we engage with the Bye Bye Market Vendor Associations. We link them with Department of Trade and Industries for them to access microfinance and also for them to have training or capacity building in terms of micro-scaling enterprises. So, that's that's for that's for our initial um, engagement and interventions, Doctor Ed. Okay, okay, congratulations. Thank you, Paul. I'm done. Hey, th that was Ms. Hadasha Bungat from Visaya State University. And thank you also, um, Dr. C, for addressing your question. Our next presenter is from Summer State University. She'll be presenting her paper entitled, Applicability of Cove Douglas Economic Model on Longline Culture of Muscle Pernaviridis in Samar, Philippines. But before she present her paper, let me acknowledge the presence of uh, the University President of Summer State University, Dr. Marilyn D. Cardoso. Ma'am, good morning and welcome to our track. Once again, let's welcome our next presenter, Ms. Noemi Jokton Pajarilio. Good morning, everyone. I am Noemi Chokton Pajarilio from Summer State University, Mercedes Campus. Allow me to present my research entitled A Profitability Analysis of Cobb Douglas Economic Model on Longline Culture of Muscle in Samar, Philippines. This study evaluates the profitability and technical efficiency of longline muscle culture method in Samar using the Cobb Douglas Economic Model. This approach examines the profitability of the production model of two different muscle culture, which is the staking method and the long line. The purpose of the study is to show the difference between the capital investment and pro potential profit. Through this, farmers and investors can have the opportunity to evaluate the economic performance of the different muscle culture methods. 
The mussel industry is an important component of the aquaculture sector in the Philippines. Mussels are the chief source of protein and mussel farming provides additional income and livelihood to fisherfolk in many coastal areas. Despite these advantages of mussel farming, there has not been a significant increase in the production of mussels in the past years. This can be traced to its low value in the community, little market demand, poor sanitary quality, adherence of red tides, unpredictable supply, and the traditional culture method used by the mussel farmers. So, uh, the objective of this study is the objective of this study is to apply Cobb Douglas economic model of longline culture of mussels of mussel in Catbalogan City, Yabong, Terangnan, and Villarreal Samar. Specifically, this study aims to first is to assess and describe the current level of profitability and technical efficiency of mussel production in Samar, Philippines. Second, or the last and the last one, evaluate the level of determinants of technical efficiency in mussel production. The next slide is the comparison between the traditional method and the long line method. So I am uh, highlighting the traditional method that one of its disadvantage is it increases sedimentation in the mussel bed and it shallows the culture area. Now when we use the long line, uh, long line method of culturing mussel, um, one of its uh, advantages is it increases production, produces better quality mussel, and another one is environmental friendly and climate resilient. Now, showing to you the Cobb Douglas economic model. Thereafter, studies on this new model have become the focus of technocrats, policymakers, academicians, economists, and aquaculture practitioners. Cobb Douglas production function, on the other hand, is a specific standard equation that is applied to describe how much input or output are required in the production process with capital and labor as input factors. It was developed by the economist Paul Douglas and mathematician Charles Cobb. Cobb Douglas production functions are commonly used in both macroeconomics and microeconomics because they have convenient and realistic properties. Now, for my methodology, the study site, profitability model of traditional and the long line culture method were considered in this study based on the data collected in the different pre-identified areas where mussels is grown in the municipalities of Samar. Focus group discussion, one-on-one -on -one interview, and ethnic survey were conducted. This includes field visit and site observation in collecting data. This study was conducted in the traditional mussel growing areas in the municipality of Yabong, Catbalogan City, Villarreal, and Tarangnan Samar. Now, the next slide shows the analytical framework, the Cobb Douglas production function, and the equation shows the P, L, K, the beta, the labor, the L and K, alpha, beta. Where P represents the total production, L, labor, K, capital, B, total factor productivity, alpha and beta are the output elasticities of labor and capital respectively. Now, the next slide shows the variables assumed to affect muscle seed production where it shows the, I have here 14 variables and based on the result, for the muscle seed production function, the age of the broodstock has the highest positive correlation to the muscle seed production. The production, however, is least correlated to the farmer's attendance to trainings. The multiple regression equation implies that increasing most factors would result in a higher muscle seed production apart from the broodstock size and the age of the muscle bed. 
further increasing the such positively correlated variables and decreasing negatively correlated variables by one unit will increase production by 50.49 times. Of the variables that were considered, the age of the bird stock has the highest positive correlation to the muscle seed production. The production, however, is least correlated to the farmer's attendance and training. The coefficient of determination is 99.72%, which suggests that the model developed is highly reliable. Further, the F value of 50.49 means that the variables considered for the model is significant at 95% confidence level. And for the model for muscle production of long culture in summer, the results increase production by 5.23 times, which is very significant. The coefficient of determination was computed as 99.28%, which means that the combination of the variables is highly um, correlated to the production of the muscles. The next slide shows the profitability analysis or the project cost and income of long line and stake method of muscle farming in Samar. The net present value or the NPV for long line culture method is higher than the stake method, which means it is more profitable project to be considered. While capital costs for long line are higher than stake method, these are offset by the higher operating costs of the later. The higher lifetime of long line makes it more economic and practical labor practical labor-wise over a longer term. For the conclusion, long-line method, ha higher capital investment but lower operating expense, more profitable in the long run for possible investors, the Cobb-Douglas economic model predicts an increase of 5.23 times in muscle when in one unit increase is achieved in all variables. Thank you. That was Noemi Jukton Paharilio from Summer State. For the Q&A portion, let's welcome once again Dr. Ortiz and Sir Tarayo. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Sir Jeff. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Paharilio, for your presentation. Um, as promoted by DOST, the Pinoy long line method for muscle production is proven to be cost effective in producing high quality muscle. Um, it also provides higher production and the return of investment and is considered to be environmental friendly. Um, as of 2018, the work of Dr. Pedroso of UP Visayas showed that the method allowed for faster growth and attainment of marketable size. Um, may I know, uh, Professor Parilio, if there is anyone from Yabong who are or who is you already using the the uh, method? Yes, Professor Parilio. We are calling the attention of Ma'am Paharilio. Ma'am, are you around in our room? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, hello, Ma'am Paharilio. Uh, did you hear my question mm -hmm. earlier? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Naka-unmute po yung... Ano, uh, ah, okay. Um, okay. In... Yes, sir. I interviewed. The technology was introduced, but the farmers did not residents um kinukuha po yung materials nila so hindi po na sustain mm. okay so next question um the paper uh, that you submitted uses the Cobb Douglas production function right um, yes, sir. How did you arrive at the estimation of the alpha and beta constants?
Um, I just based on the result of the Ma'am Parilio, do you have a Hello. clear reception? Sorry, sir. Of... Okay, ma'am. You mean narration, ma'am, in answering the question of Dr. Ortiz. Okay, okay. So I just, um, I just based my result and the, um, computed the result of my statistician. Did you try some um, optimization as to the estimation of the alpha and beta constants, or you just um, directly inputted some values in your formula, um, Professor Parillo? Yes, sir. Directly inputted for uh, the the data. Okay. Um, uh, so last question, Professor Parillo. Um, how can we convince our local muscle farmers to switch to the long line culture method? Um, uh, based on one of my uh, one of the persons I have interviewed, he told me that um, farmers did not uh, they, they don't adopt the technology because of the high cost. So he's the only one. Um, using the technology in Tarangnan uh, until t today because uh, he believed that this technology, uh, it would help the, the environment to, uh, to uh, the environment for the future use uh, to decrease the sedimentation of the, the area. So okay, can, uh, by the way, how much is the total cost if we try to use the long line method? initially uh, depending on the how the uh, the areas are that you are going to use for example a uh, 50 meters long line depend uh estimatedly you uh, you budget your budget will be 50 um uh, 50,000 uh, 50, maybe SSU could venture into a certain project that would finance and help the um, actually, local sir, um, yes, sir. Uh, farmers or fishermen. Um, SSU Mercedes anyway, uh, that, that would be all, uh, to... Professor Paharilio. Oh, yes, Thank sir. you and congratulations on Thank your you. presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz, and uh, congratulations, Ma'am Paharilio, for your paper presentation. Well, we are down to our last paper presenter for the morning session, last but never least. She is from Summer State University. Her paper has the title Development and Validation of Knowledge, Beliefs, and Social Dimension of a Red Tide Phenomenon. But before she presents her paper, let me acknowledge the following persons who are present in our room. We have Ched Region 8, Leo Camposano. The OST Region 2, Ms. Weng de Guzman, the President, University President of Leyte Normal University, President Jude Duarte, PSA Memaropa, Lenny uh, Rio, uh, Rio Florido, and of course, our University President, Ma'am Cardoso. Ma'am and Sir, welcome to our track. Let me introduce to you our paper presenter, Ma'am Edeline Ichapare.
let me start with the saying, assessment is today's means of modifying tomorrow's life situation by Carol Anton Linson. Today I'm going to present the, our study entitled Development and Validation of Knowledge, Beliefs and Practices Skill in Assessing the Social Dimension of Red Tide Phenomenon. I am Dr. Adeline O. Itchapari and my co-researchers are Dr. Reze Bimindanyo, Dr. Abigail M. Kabaging, Mernil B. Gal, Emma Q. Tinidero, Maria Ruby M. Parocho, and Maria Angelica F. Alcantara. Red tide is a natural phenomenon that affects health, economic livelihood, and destroy marine ecosystem. Red tide recurrences aggravate poverty incidents in Samar. However, availability of the literature concerning the social dimension in red tide is limited. There is no existing standard instrument to widen studies on red tide social aspects. So uh, there is an utmost importance of having a standard survey instrument in assessing the social dimension of Samarino. So this is study aimed to develop and validate a scale that will measure the social dimension of Samarino uh, in mitigating red tide. So in conducting the research, an exploratory sequential mixed method research design was used in the development and validation of knowledge, beliefs, and practices scale that will measure the social dimension of submarine use uh, in red tide. In an exploratory uh, design, qualitative data was first collected and analyzed, and themes were used to derive the development of a quantitative instrument to further explore the research problem. As a result of this design, there were three stages of analysis were conducted. So first is the qualitative phase, and then the quantitative phase, and finally, the integration of the phase that connects the two strands of data and extends the initial qualitative exploratory findings. Uh, in this study, the first phase in the development of scale starts with item development using qualitative exploration of social dimension of red tide through in-depth interviews. Then the findings from this qualitative phase guided the development of knowledge, beliefs, practices, a skill, which will be evaluated in the third phase. In gathering the qualitative data, a phenomenological approach to qualitative exploration was undertaken because the purpose was to explore the social dimension of red tide. Hence, in-depth interviews was conducted with a sample from the population to gain a thorough understanding of participants' experiences on red tide. Participants were introduced to the study and were asked to read and sign the informed consent form. After interviews, permission was granted. All interviews uh, were all due recorded and the interviewees were assured that their identity were kept confidential and no association between their identity and audio recording were made. During the interviews, a semi-structured uh, interview guide were followed to make sure that all of the interviewees were given the same information about the study and were asked the same questions. There were 15 participants who were interviewed and hence the data gathered were qualified for phenomenological data analysis using Colise's uh, framework. The data from these interviews were thematically analyzed with the results informing that the identification of items to be added or deleted from the initial questionnaire. Then after experts judges evaluated of each item to determine whether they represent the domain of knowledge, beliefs, and practices scale, five experts examined the content of the items that were generated. 
for the skill development phase, uh, pre-testing, I mean, uh, exploratory factor analysis and confirmatory factor analysis were conducted. Pre-testing of the questions, uh, the questions has been pre-tested to 100 Samarinius using a random sampling. Then after the pre-testing of the questions, actual survey were administered to 600 Samarinius. 300 respondents was considered for each factor analysis. Respondents were randomly selected. And scale development item reduction analysis was uh, conducted to ensure that only parsimonious, functional, and internally consistent items are ultimately included. Therefore, the goal of uh, this phase was to identify uh, the items that are not or uh, or are the least related to the domain under study for deletion or uh, modification. So in this study, the factor analysis, both exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis were used in uh, reducing items. Factor analysis is a multivariate statistical procedure that has many uses. First is uh, to reduce a large number of variables into smaller set of variables. Another is to establish underlying dimensions between measured variables and latent constructs, thereby allowing the formation and refinement of theory. And the third one is it provides construct validity evidence of self-reporting scales. So in this study, the exploratory factor analysis was used to analyze the factor structure of the responses received on the interviews conducted and the confirmatory factor analysis was used to test the hypothesis that a relationship between the items included to measure the knowledge, beliefs, and practices and their underlying latent constructs exists. For the, the results, the results shows that there were three themes uh, emerge from the interviews, and these are uh, knowledge, beliefs, and practices. Knowledge, beliefs, and practices. Ninety-seven. Uh, there were ninety-seven initial items that were generated or derived during the uh, uh, generation of uh, the questionnaire of the questions. 20 items were generated from the literature and 77 items are from the, we got we got this from the interview that we have conducted. So the result also shows that the content validity index suggests that there are 17 items that are needed to be omitted from the initial pool of 97 items. The developed test has uh, uh, turns to 80 items. And then uh, from 80 items, it reduced to uh, 45 items. Then the revised knowledge, beliefs, and practices scale is highly reliable using Cronbach's Alpha. Uh, this uh, table, I mean, this figure shows the script plot, which suggests that four-factor solution uh, is in contrast to the 15-factor solution offered by Kaiser's criterion, which has been criticized for retaining too many factors in some circumstances. In this study, uh, oblique rotation was used since the underlying constructs are assumed to be correlated. Criteria for item deletion was determined by the values of the item loadings and cross loadings on the factors, as well as uh, commonality estimates. Uh, an author specified that an item should be deleted if its factor loading is less than 0.4. Some have argued that an item commonality below 0.4 is seen as potentially problematic, thus it should not be retained. So in this study, 
uh, we did not include those uh, items that has this uh, values below uh, 0 0.4. The script plot in figure two shows uh, the script plot of the items in the final round uh, exploratory factor analysis. It suggests the five factors. We are done already with the presentation of, of Ma'am Ichapari. Now let's proceed to the Q&A portion. Let's welcome once again, Dr. Naboya. Okay, so good morning. Congratulations, Dr. Ichapare, and together with the other researchers. So it's good that you are coming up with a validated instrument to really determine the, the aspect on the red type phenomenon. Now, I'll dig into the qualitative aspect of this thing because you made mention that you made use of phenomenology Okay, there are two types of phenomenology, Dr. Chapare. I just would like to ask, what type of phenomenology uh, was utilized? Was it descriptive phenomenology or the interpretive or otherwise known as the hermeneutic uh, phenomenology? Because I was trying to look into, there were 15 participants diba, that were utilized in the, in the qualitative component because you, you made use of mixed method. So the, the, that was the first question, was the phenomenology descriptive or interpretive? Second, with the 15 participants, what were the inclusion criteria? I said, when, since we employ phenomenology, it should have been based on human experience of the phenomenon on that side. So may I know the inclusion criteria in the selection of your participants? Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Naboya. So, uh, the, pheno the type of phenomenological approach that we use in the study is uh, the descriptive uh, phenomenological in which uh, we were able to conduct the in-depth interview and uh, later the collected data were able to, uh, uh, we were able to uh, grouped it and then uh, described it into uh, several factors. Uh, uh, we use the thematic as uh, uh, thematic in synthesizing the the answers of uh, the participants and the inclusion criteria uh, of the participants includes uh, they must be uh, farmers. Uh, Tahong farmers is only because uh, they are the most affected during red tide phenomenon. And then there are also some uh, residents along the coastal area in which uh, uh, also the reason is they are uh, the most uh, vulnerable to this uh, phenomenon. Oh, okay, so so more or less from your study, because you are trying to come up with an instrument that is duly developed and validated by your group. Do you think from the qualitative aspect was 15 participants really enough to be, let's say that uh, you have already obtained the necessary or the sufficient amount of data to come up with the, with the uh, with the number of questions that are to be asked in this or to be framed in this instrument. That's the last question I have, Dr. Ichapare. I have uh, in-depth interview is just one of the approach, but uh, uh, another is uh, we also refer to the references that are available. So actually in the generation of uh, the questions, there were uh, additional 20 items that were generated from uh, from references, and then 77 were generated from the in-depth interview. Okay, thank you. At least there were triangulation, so we're not only uh, basing it on the interview itself. Okay, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mami Chapare, and of course, 
to Dr. Yeah. Naboya for your question. Thank you so much. It's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. We have just witnessed almost half of our paper presentations and stay tuned for more this afternoon. Our gratitude is expressed, of course, to our dear evaluators, Dr. Ortiz, Sir Tarayo, Dr. Naboya, and Dr. C for your expertise. And we will be expecting again your presence this afternoon. We thank also the presenters for having the courage and determination to present your papers. Indeed, you are poverty alleviators. For some announcements, we will be flashing another Zoom link on the screen for you to join after this session. So I, I guess our technical committee now is going to flash this, the link on the screen for you to join after this session. You may access it afterwards. Then later at exactly 1 p.m., just make it sure to join the same link we had just had this morning for the afternoon session. Again, a Zoom link will be I'm back once again. We just had a technical glitch. The link will be commented down on our chat box for you to join in after this session. And we are expecting for you to return at exactly 1 p.m. And please join the same link we just had this morning. See you okay. again later to Thank spend the other much. half of the day discovering innovative ways to achieve our common goal. You may also take okay. your lunch first and join Thank other tracks so since we finished before our expected time. So bye for now and stay tuned. Bon appetit and see you everyone. Okay, bye-bye. See you Great later. Great job, bye. moderator Jen. Hi, see you later. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, see you later. Thank you. Okay.